Sociology is a call to vote. Um, yes, Mr. Anderson. Here. Ms. Gill. Here. Ms. Litton. Here. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Russell. Here. And Mr. Webb. Here. Thank you. And we have a guest with us tonight who is going to lead us in the pledge. Nathan, go ahead. All right, so if everyone please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Hey Nathan, if you would come up, just introduce yourself and just tell us what you, what you're hanging out with us to kind of get a little information. If you come up to that mic right there in the middle. So, hello, I'm I'm Nathan Horn, and I'm here. I'm just a visitor here for this meeting. I'm going to be taking notes or minutes. Um, uh, for my communications merit badge as a, as I am a Boy Scout. Very good. Well, we're happy to have you here with us tonight, and thank you for, for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Glad to. All right, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda for this evening? So moved. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Can I get a second? Second. All right, second. Uh, Ms. Lynn, I'll give that one to you. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Right. Right. Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. All right. We are at our Spotlight FCCPS, and I will turn over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome um, to our school board meeting tonight. Uh, very fortunate to be able to um, highlight some of the incredible services that we provide to our uh, most in need kids many times, um, specifically some of our students that have physical um, needs. Uh, and so tonight, we have uh, highlighted some of our folks in our occupational therapy and therapy services. And uh, they are a huge part of our service team here in the City of Falls Church Schools. And uh, we appreciate their service very much. And so we thought we would share a video tonight um, showing a little bit about what they do. And we have one of our great therapists here. So, so we'll let her join us at the end. We have two occupational therapists here at our district. Um, I cover here at TJ and also at uh, MEH. We have another therapist, Barbara Sadi. She covers the preschool, Mount Daniel, and um, the high school as well. Occupational therapists in Falls Church City get to work from the preschool level all the way up to high school. So we start at preschool, then we'll work to Mount Daniel. Mount Daniel is then more focused on um, fine motor skills again, getting these kids ready for more educational-based learning. So learning to write, learning to cut, so using scissors, giving them different opportunities to learn versus um, just a standard classroom type of setup. The goal of OT at TJ is to help students with their daily living skills, their fine motor skills, and their sensory processing skills. Hapso works one-on-one -on -one with some of my students during the week and she also has a gross uh, fine motor group and she works on cooking skills. Some of my kids are absolutely thrilled to go to her classroom to do her different activities. My students love Miss Raman more than probably being anywhere else in the school. Uh, Miss Raman is a great resource for general education teachers. When teachers are concerned about a student's handwriting, she's always available to provide suggestions and strategies for improvement. In my classroom, she has provided templates and special writing paper for students to practice proper letter formation, as well as different types of pencil grips to assist students with proper finger placement. One of the areas we focus on in OT is to help students with using assistive technology. So we have a lot of students who struggle a um, lot with writing, not just from the fine motor, but also from the academic pieces of learning to organize their thoughts into a sentence, sequence it all together, spell, and then when you add the physical difficulty on top of all that, it's very challenging for them. So when we give them the assistive technology piece, it really helps them overcome that barrier and they're much more successful with producing writing output. 
Uh, we're very fortunate in this district that we have one-on-one -on -one devices now, so all our students have access to a computer so they can use the computer. And for assistive technology, for writing, we often use uh, word prediction programs or voice recognition programs, and it takes away a lot of that energy that they would have otherwise had to struggle with. Um, physically as well as cognitively. I do a weekly cooking group here and we focus on helping the students learn the step-by-step -step routine of following a simple recipe. We put, them, we put the steps in order so they learn to sequence that. Then we work on figuring out what the tools and materials we need for the recipes, working on that organizational piece. Then we get into the actual cooking piece where we work on a lot of manipulation skills like opening packages, pouring, mixing, using utensils. So it's a great way to target a lot of different skills, um, not just fine motor, but um, a lot of um, behavioral skills as well. They learn to take turns, they learn to follow directions, and it's a great way for them to enjoy the activity as well. So Hafsa Rahman is with us tonight, um, and as you know, she was uh, a, the star of the show this evening. Um, so I, it's, a, it's a team. It's a team process. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to thank you very much for your incredible work. And thank you for. <laughs> oh, there we go. So I don't know if you have any questions or. I'm just going to say, uh, see if the board has any questions um, at all. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Roman, I wonder, it was interesting to hear about both the assistive technology and the use of the cooking. I, th I, I don't know, to me I would not have thought about it either, uh, thought about the cooking particularly, but can you talk a little bit more about the assistive so, tech, yeah, how sure, that works? Yeah, sure, sure. So occupational therapy, I mean, it's, it's so diverse in, in terms of what areas to focus on. So there's that fine motor piece, there's a self-care, daily living skills. And then, so the assistive technology piece comes in uh, related to writing. So when we have kids who come in with a lot of fine motor difficulties, and we start out working with a lot of the foundational skills that they need to work on and the physical motor control and all that. But for a lot of kids, they just can't get past that. And it just doesn't come quickly enough for them to get over that barrier of needing to produce writing in the classroom. So because in the, they go in the classroom and they're expected to write a paragraph, but their fine motor skills, despite the intervention, is not enough to get them to that level. So that's where we bring in assistive technology to bridge that gap. Okay. Okay, thanks. No, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Sure. Ms. Russell? So is there a specific, I guess, grade that you're looking at where you make the switch from? Because I know for the handwriting that you kind of can only take them so far and then at some point it seems exactly. they switch over yeah. to this because it's yeah. kind of more ingrained in their yeah. habits and so on and so forth. So is there like a cutoff that you use for when you switch them over to the assisted technology? There is not a, like a general cutoff. It's so individual. You really have to look at the individual student. So you might have a student in second grade whose physical deficit is so huge and so challenging that we bring in the assistive technology right then, as early as second grade. But you could have a student whose deficit is not that severe, and you can you feel like, okay, there's potential for handwriting here, so let's push that student more to the handwriting. So we delay the technology a little bit more. And the other, other thing we look at is when we want to bring in the technology, it's uh, a lot of the times we want to bring in to help build confidence for the student. So a lot of the times the students who are struggling with writing, they, they really have a low self-esteem about their writing pieces. Like they just come out feeling like, I can't write. So when you bring in assistive technology, it boosts their confidence too. Sometimes it's for emotional, that self-esteem as well. Just, um, I know you don't work at the high school level, but I'm just curious 
is it a lot of the same skills you're working on at the high school level? Yeah, or, so, or so the high school level, um, we have a <coughs> life skills program there as well. So similar kind of skills are addressed there for um, the self-care and the like the, the OT there, she also does a cooking group over there. Um, there's, um, but there's also more focus on the vocational piece because these kids are getting ready to get out there and be independent and have a job. So there's more um, focus on learning how to um, go grocery shopping and how to handle money and making a list and um, following through those kinds of activities. And, and some of the students who are already going out into the jobs too, like um, um, with our tr transition person that we have right now. Um, so some of the kids are already going out, so sometimes we, we target those students, like what is it that they need to do when they're in their job, and is there something they need to work on in school for that? Any other questions? Um, I just want, I guess, Mr. Castillo. Uh, well, thanks for all the work that you and your your team do in this important area, Ms. Roman. And just wondering, how much time do students spend with you at a time and then during the week? So typical sessions are um, 30 minutes um, um, because we really want to keep it to a level where the students are not missing out too much from their classroom. So uh, we generally limit it to 30 minutes if it's a one-on-one -on -one session. But when it's a group activity, like when we do cooking activity, um, because of the nature of the task, it takes a little bit longer, so it could be 45 or one, one hour, but typically not more than that. Um, and the frequency also varies. It could be once a week. It could be twice a week, depending on the student's needs. Thank you. I um, just want to thank you for all the work that you do. It kind of gives us that opportunity to see that we work with all students at every level here in the city of falls church and what you do kind of gets students prepared for that next step in life as mm -hmm. they get ready to move on from from the starting of elementary school all the way through high school so it's a great something that you all do that makes sure that we 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 look out for all students at every and meet them where they are at all levels in the school system all right thank you very much You're welcome okay thank you Ms. Ron. thank you it is a good reminder of how diverse our community is uh, and we directly serve 19% of the city of Falls Church for eight hours a day. And we take all kids and we work with all of them in, in very unique and interesting ways. And I'm very proud of the work of our, of our teachers and our OTs. Thank you very much, Dr. Nana. Uh, so we are now at public comment in accordance with school board bylaw 2.30. The time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to the board members and for the record for dissemination of requests. Are there any comments? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so next we will move into uh, closed meeting. Uh, do we expect to? Five minutes. Okay. Shouldn't be very long. Uh, if someone would read us into close, please. Okay. <laughs> Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under Section 2.2-377A1, in particular, staff appointment, staff reassignment, staff resignation, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change in position, child care leave, long-term medical leave, leave of absence, and advisory committee appointments and resignations, and student matters under Section 2.2-3711A2, in particular, non-resident tuition student. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Layton. Uh, Ms. Goodell, if you would. Mr. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Castillo. Aye. Ms. Gill. Aye. Ms. Layton. Aye. Mr. Whiteman. Oh, sorry. Ms. Russell. Aye. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Got a broken wheel. Justin. I know you weren't here for the last meeting. There's something else. We have a snack box around here. Just like that.
the Taylor Road system now? Is no, what system? What's that? I'm just trying to I'm trying to trying to catch So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Gill. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And if someone would certify, please. Okay. Whereas the Falls Church City Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires cert certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, <coughs> or considered. Thank you, Mr. Cabello. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Ms. Bell? Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Gill? Aye. Ms. Litton? Aye. Ms. Russell? Aye. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. We will move on to um, reports and recognitions. Okay. And then I will um, move unanimous consent to approve the consent agenda. Without objections, so order. Right. And we'll go on to the business action uh, 8.01 State of the Schools for Jesse Backery, Mount Daniel, and Thomas Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening again, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome up our really good friends from uh, Jesse Thackeray, Thomas Jefferson, and Mount Daniel. Tonight we have Rachel Hamburger, the director at Jesse Thackeray, uh, Paul Swanson from uh, Thomas Jefferson Elementary School, Aaron Truesdell from Mount Daniel, and Jeremy Ferrara, who is um, wearing two hats this evening. Uh, he is here as the assistant principal at Mount Daniel, but also as the administrator of Jesse Thackeray, working in tandem with Rachel. Hamburger, so I'd like to invite, you, this is the point, you have to get up and come up here, <laughs> <laughs> invite you to the table. Um, this is a continuation of our ongoing uh, presentations of the state of the schools. Uh, last meeting you had a chance to hear from our two secondary schools, Mr. Hills and, and uh, Ms. Hardy, and this evening you get to hear from this uh, incredible team. And um, I just want to say up front how impressed I've been with all of them this year, and tonight is an opportunity to share some of the incredible things that they've, they've been doing uh, this year. So with that, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Here, if you could put yours over there so they can kind of, your, your microphone. Oh, yes. I think it'll reach so they can aren't back and forth yeah, as much. So, <laughs> right. This is going to be a problem. <laughs> thank you all very much for being here this evening. We're excited to hear about what's going on in your schools. As I said before, last time, we all don't get to, to visit as often as we would like. So it's a great opportunity for us to hear the new and exciting things that are going on over there and give you a chance to, to share those with us. So I don't know how y'all want to start, but well, we're going to go youngest to oldest, I think. The floor is yours. So thank you for having us tonight. Um, like Dr. Noonan said, I'm Rachel Hamburger. I'm the preschool director. Um, and at Jesse Thackeray, we have <coughs> 72 students. It's a fully inclusive program. <coughs> Um, so we looked at the triennial plan and the first thing is our alignment with MTSS. Um, when Summer Manos and I started looking at MTSS for preschool, um, we found out that there's actually a pyramid model that you can see up there. So it's the younger version of PBIS for the preschoolers. So we are starting in that blue area, high quality supportive environments and nurturing and responsive relationships. And together, Summer and I adapted a super friends curriculum that's put out by, um, I think it's called Cephal. And it's a powerhouse um, that puts out the pyramid model. So Summer and I adopted Super Friends and there's a social story that goes along with it to teach children 
um, social skills and how to share and how to request toys. And then we have a Super Friends cape that the teacher can use for celebrations. So whereas the older schools have um, little tickets that they give out, and they'll probably talk more about that, we use the Super Friends cape as our celebration. Um, and it really gives that the kids a concrete thing to hang their hat on. Um, and then there's also a solutions kit. So the kids can get cards if they are in sort of a dispute. Uh, they can go get the cards and ask, ask the teacher or take turns. And the cards sort of guide them through those situations. And all the teachers have them on their lanyards as well. So that's our start to MTSS. We've just started it. We introduced Super Friends this year, and we'll continue working on that. Um, so special populations, as you can see at the top, the number of students with disabilities served by <coughs> JTP has risen <coughs> considerably in the last four years. Um, this is a chart since we flipped our model and became an inclusive program. Um, a fully inclusive program. So when we opened, we had 15 students with disabilities, and we now have 41 students. Actually, as of last count, when I went into the system today, we had 44 students with disabilities. 12 of those are speech-only students, so they receive only speech services. So they might come in and work with Ms. Manzione, our speech therapist, or they're in the classroom and we're identified as needing speech therapy in addition. Um, so the rest either have developmental delays or are um, on the autism spectrum, things of that nature. So the other special population that we serve, we take at-risk students. And the four-year-olds are funded partially through the Virginia Preschool Initiative. And the three-year-olds come on a sliding scale. Uh, so this is the percentage of rising K students meeting the pre-K PALS developmental range. Um, as you can see, last year, students with disabilities did really well. They met the developmental range a considerable amount of time. And also the non-native English speakers, which is how they're designated in the PALS system, um, also did really well with their scores. So wanted to highlight that. Um, OK. So <laughs> PYP and IB, we use the creative curriculum, which is an inquiry-based curriculum. So it sort of lends itself to the PYP uh, program. Um, each, there are a bunch of different units, and each unit has a guiding question each week. So for instance, the ball unit, um, the kids were talking about balls and what types of balls you can play with and how balls bounce, and then they got into talking about planets because planets look like balls. And so then they took this whole turn to planets. So it really can, it lends itself to student interest. Um, social emotional well-being, we have two curricula, the <coughs> second step curriculum, which is for the four to five year olds. As you can see, there are five main units, um, skills for learning, empathy, emotion management, friendship skills, and problem solving, and then the transition to kindergarten. So each week they talk about a different skill area. Uh, this year we were lucky enough the, one of the social workers and one of the school psychologists has started a trauma-informed care training, and we were the first school that they did the training with, and we are doing the second half of the training next month. So they talked about adverse childhood case, adverse childhood experiences, and how that really shapes the way that children respond to their environment. Um, we also have a behavior specialist we share with Mount Daniel, and she supports students who are struggling with uh, social emotional skills. And then we have to report to the state on the progress in social emotional skills for all children with IEPs. So it's an indicator in the state report, and it's part of indicator seven, and we have to 
rate their progress from when they come into the program to when they leave the program. So what's special about our school? It is fully inclusive, and that is very rare in the state. Um, only 27% of children with IEPs aged three to five in Virginia receive the majority of special ed and related services in the regular education setting. And that probably in a lot of divisions is the really high functioning kids with speech impairments and you know high functioning autism it's not the kids who are severely impacted and our kids are lucky enough that everyone is included so they get to learn from their peers they have those language models and it's really exciting to see the acceptance that the peers have, but also the peers learn from the kids with disabilities. Um, it's just a really special place. And then the MEH kids come in and volunteer, and it's really cool to see them working with our kids. Um, and we serve all areas of the community. So we have tuition paying peers, we have the at risk kids, and we have the special ed students. We serve all the special ed students in the city, um, ages two to five. And then we try and find all the at-risk kids that we can take in. Um, and then we have a waiting list for our tuition students. So that is our program. Thank you very much. Are we going to, we'll, you want to do all three and then take some questions? Or would you prefer to take questions one at a time? Y'all have preference? Uh, I just do them all at once. All right, on to Mount Daniel. Sorry we didn't sit in the right order. <laughs> I am next. Um, so the state of our schools, that is actually a picture from this morning. So that is approximately what the building looks like as of right now. We're growing quite quickly there. Um, but we're going to focus a little more on what's happening inside today. So first is MTSS. Um, so we kind of have two areas that we're focusing on with MTSS, the behavior side of things with PBIS. Um, and then the instructional side of things. So behavior, this is our second year of full implementation. So the graphic on the left is our behavior matrix. So that's something that the teachers all created together and that's the common language that we use when we're teaching the students what we expect of them. And this is organized by area in the school. So it's an easy way for the kids to learn um, what we're expecting and then we do recognize them for doing the right thing with our hippo hoorays. If you have children at Mount Daniel, I'm sure you've heard about them. <laughs> um, they get a little ticket that we chose to align those with the PYP units of inquiry um, and the PYP learner profile because we really wanted it to connect to what we do instructionally as well. So a child will get a hippo hooray for exhibiting one of the learner profile traits. So they might be caring if they helped a friend who um, needed help packing up at the end of the day. And the key with this is that teachers give specific feedback so that students know exactly what they did that it was that was desirable. Um, and we, this is the second year of implementation. So this year we've played a little bit with focusing on specific things in classrooms. So if say a classroom is having an issue with playing at recess appropriately, they might give extra hippo hoorays for appropriate play at recess. So we're toying a little bit with that this year. Um, the other side of things is our RTI model or our tiered systems of support for all students. So all students receive their core content in the classroom, that's their tier one. And then tier two interventions could happen with, if it's an academic concern, either the classroom teacher with a little extra time in the classroom, or it could look like an intervention with a specialist a couple of days a week in a group of students. So that would be a tier two intervention. Um, if it's a behavior concern, then typically it's a little bit of consultation either with a guidance counselor or behavior specialist that then the teacher implements something extra for that student. It might be a behavior plan, it might be a check-in, check-out type of system, but just something a little bit extra to help them get back on track. Um, tier three would be the most intensive intervention. So that would be every day with a specialist, either one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, or where there is someone going into the classroom to work with a student on, say, behavior and really kind of do some explicit teaching with that child. 
Um, so it lets us kind of meet the needs of all students without removing them from their environment, with letting them be with their peers and in the least restrictive environment kind of before we go to the special education side of things. Um, support for teachers in this process is important too. So we kind of have a structure to help make sure that teachers are identifying students for the correct tiers. Um, the kind of basis for that is all of the teachers meet bi-weekly with their teams, and unfortunately it's with half of their team due to our schedule, but they brainstorm on their in-class um, at interventions, so they might say, you know, I've been working on this student with letter sounds and they're progressing but not quite quick enough. Do you have an idea of something else I can try? And so it's four or five teachers sitting together with a reading specialist, with um, Jeremy and myself, and really kind of checking on those kids that are maybe a little bit behind to make sure they're making progress to get back on track. Um, if in that meeting we feel like we're not quite sure what to try next with a the kid, they're just not making the progress we wanna see, then we would have a longer meeting called an RTI consult team meeting where we pull in some of the specialists. So that classroom teacher would come with data about whatever the concern is. It could be behavior, it could be academics, and then we would have our speech therapist there, our guidance counselor, our reading specialist, and our behavior specialist to really take some time to talk about the child and what we think might be causing some of the issues, um, what we could put in place to kind of help with those issues, and then we set a goal for where we would like them to be in typically six weeks time, and then we come back together to meet again to see, well, did what we put in place work, or do we need to try something different? Um, and then if we feel like it's working and it's great, the kid's making great progress, we keep on with the intervention, or we could say they've completely caught up, they don't need it anymore. Um, or if we still feel like we need a little more information, we would call a school-based team meeting where we're looking at potential evaluation for special education, we get the family involved. So it kind of gives teachers a framework for helping them support some of these students that are performing below grade level or not exhibiting the same type of behavior that we would expect for their age. Um, which kind of leads us into special populations. A lot of the students that go through that RTI process are our special population students. Um, so they're students that maybe aren't identified now but could potentially be identified later with a disability. They're students, a lot of our um, non-English speaking students go through that process or they're students that have come to us with some kind of needs from home. Um, so we have a pretty good system in place to support those kids, but some extra things we put into place this year were some professional development sessions. Um, we did one joint session with TJ, which I'm sure you'll talk about too, where teachers got to choose what they wanted to learn about based on their needs. Um, we've also been holding grade level sessions during team meetings with either the LEAP teachers or the special education teachers or the reading specialist. Um, they've kind of been taking turns visiting team meetings to give teachers some real time, you know, I have this student, this is the problem, what can we do to help brainstorming on the job type of PD. Um, and then we've been having teachers share out positive strategies, especially in the area <coughs> of behavior in our staff meetings. So our behavior specialist that Rachel mentioned has kind of identified people that are either working on their own with behavior that have great strategies or that have implemented something that she suggested and will show a little video and have the teacher talk about how it's working for them to kind of teach people that you know this is either a resource you could go to in this teacher or this is something you could try for yourselves. Um, when we do have our data meetings with kind of our smaller leadership team, we have been focusing on those special populations, making sure we look at those kids that fall into those categories and that they're making progress kind of from that school level to make sure that, you know, the, the classroom teachers are recommending people, but then as we look at the whole school, is there anyone that is falling through the cracks? And this year we really haven't found anyone that the teachers have missed. The teachers <laughs> know their kids very well. Um, and overall, we've seen great gains with, with this system this year. People have been very focused. I think that the goals from the division have helped um, to kind of hone in on what's really important, and we've seen great results from, from the work with the students this year. Um, PYP is another huge part of what we do at Mount Daniel. Um, this year specifically, we had a training at the very start of school, and it kind of led us to thinking that we need to update some of our central ideas to be a little more broad and a little more internationally minded. So I think now that we've 
been through an evaluation and you know we've had the program for five years we're ready to kind of take it to that next level and really connect everything into these units and so the training at the beginning of the year we brought in a presenter who was very intense but very knowledgeable <laughs> and she, <laughs> she was quite intense <laughs> but she was very knowledgeable and she gave us some really good ideas about what to do moving forward so the teams were focusing on looking at kind of the whole way that PYP works is each unit and there's six of them has a central idea so everything is tied back to that central idea and then at the end of the unit there's a summative assessment that gauges whether the students learn the central idea Kind of in a nutshell and so we've really been looking at that and is this central idea the most important thing we could be teaching them through this unit a lot of them have changed over the last year which is fantastic that the teachers are willing to take that risk and change something because if you change what the whole unit's about you're going to change what you're teaching too and so that's involved a lot of extra planning um, and then we've identified that kind of our next step now that we've done this is to create some rubrics for those summative assessments this year we created the new summatives and we kind of wanted to see how the students did and now that we've done it once with most of them the next step is rubric to kind of quantify the students success with the units um, we have specialist writing planners because the ib would like all standalone subjects to have planners as well so our specialists like the pe teacher is writing a planner for pe um, the art teacher is writing a planner for art so that's something that we dabbled in last year but has really really come along nicely this year um, our math specialist is also helping create standalone planners for some of the math units that just don't quite fit you know you ha they have to learn to count but learning to count isn't really inquiry based nor does it fit within <laughs> any of the existing units but it's still something we teach so the math specialist is working on that with some of those standalone skills um, and then these photos are some examples of our international mindedness focus so first grade traditionally has done Ghana Day. They have traveled to Ghana. And so this year they decided that they wanted to broaden that. And they went to four different places, Ghana included. Um, and their photos are kind of the ones in the bottom right down there. And they focused on some general things from the country, but then also the dances in each country. So the students rotated around and we had some um, very generous spouses that came and full-on garb from Germany and we had a lot of people coming to help us to help the students experience what life would be like in those countries and then when they went back to their rooms they compared not only the countries they learned about but to the US and at the end they had to do a brochure of if we were going to teach someone about Falls Church in that way what would be special about us and what would we teach them and they their brochures, I, I would move here based on their brochures. They were quite <laughs> persuasive in their brochures. Um, and then kindergarten does the trip to Mexico. Their traditional trip to Mexico is actually today. So the fiesta was today. We had a couple people come dressed up for the fiesta. They were ready to go to Mexico on their trip. But this year we're taking the lens of also comparing Mexico, not only to the US, but the teachers chose to Canada as kind of our northern or su and southern borders. So they're bringing in a lot more of experiences from those other countries. Obviously with the real, real little ones, you can only do so much with that, but we're really trying to have an idea of, well, how do we make this broader and not just so one country focused? So that's been going well so far and kudos to the teachers and to Jeremy for all the work that they've done to, to make that happen and make all those changes happen. It's been exciting to see. Um, social and emotional well-being, we do a lot of things um, kind of supporting that, but the big ones are through Mr. Jackson, our guidance counselor's lessons. He does whole group lessons both in kindergarten and in first grade. Um, in kindergarten, he has a lot of different topics. The three-step method is a big one, which is kind of conflict resolution with peers. What do you do if someone's doing something that isn't hurting you but that you don't like um, personal space something you need versus something that's fair recess safety um, and then in first grade he also does some tattling lessons and some recess safety lessons as well um, he does see students for individual counseling on a referral basis as needed um, and then in first grade he does friendship groups so if students um, are having some kind of problems with social skills he might have a small group of students that um, works together for 30 minute sessions with him with some peers that are positive role models and some peers that need to work on some skills to kind of fine-tune those skills since they're so young um, 
He also does help some of our special education teachers with doing social skills lessons for students that have social skills goals on their IEPs. He does some of those with the special ed team, does a lot of that as well. Um, and then Red Ribbon Week is another example of an event that we do about making healthy life choices. At the elementary level, we don't focus it on the healthy life choices aspect of drugs at all, but we focus it on drinking and drinking water and drinking, you know, eating healthy, drinking water, I'm sorry. <laughs> Drink lots of water, um, eating healthy and um, exercising. And we teach the students to make those kinds of healthy choices. Um, whereas at the high school level, it's more about, you know, drug free and alcohol free. We don't really go, go that route with the little ones. Um, our FLE curriculum is the family life curriculum where we teach students a lot about different types of families. It aligns with the Virginia standards of learning for family life. Um, and something new this year that we've adopted is some of the second step curriculum um, to help us kind of fill in some of those gaps because there are some touchy subjects in there <laughs> that um, Virginia expects us to teach little kids like good touch versus bad touch at the kindergarten level. Um, so that's something that this curriculum makes it very age appropriate. Um, and Mr. Jackson goes in and assists teachers with some of those lessons since it is a little more of a difficult topic for little kids to learn. Um, mindfulness is something else that we do. This year for the first time, all of the first grade classrooms participated in mindfulness. Um, we did offer an opt out. We didn't really have anyone take us up on that. Um, but we are doing that with all first grade rooms for the first time. We piloted it and decided that first graders were a little more developmentally ready to understand some of the concepts. In kindergarten, it was a little lost on some of them. And we've seen great success with um, a lot of what the first graders have learned this year. And then alongside that, um, one of our school psychologists that does the mindfulness lessons offered a self-care group for teachers. So if teachers wanted to learn more about being mindful outside of just in their classroom, they could participate in this course that was um, on Wednesday mornings. And that was Mr. Farrar and I actually both participated. <laughs> and that was quite helpful. And to really learn about what the kids were learning, it was really nice to kind of dive into it from the student side of learning mindfulness. Um, so I did have a few students tell us about what they learned. <laughs> should never touch your private parts. Mindfulness is kind of about like when you close your eyes and you just do your mindfulness, it just feels like nothing. And then like you just sit like that and then you feel better when you open your eyes or something you forget you didn't want to think about, you forgot it because it was it's kind of like your mind, what you think about, does it go weird and it, like, it's just spinning and so you have no idea what, like what to think about and after it, like it, like you open your eyes, it's like it stops on something but not things you didn't want to think about. I would call this something where you can figure out your feelings and <coughs> Sometimes when you have pain and you can't figure out where it is, you can do a body scan and body scans basically help you uh, like find the pain and stuff. So <laughs> from the mouth of babes, their understanding of mindfulness. But we have really seen um, some huge success with some of our students that maybe do struggle with emotional regulation that have said that you know they use mindfulness when they're starting to feel upset. So it has been interesting to see what they are able to come up with. Um, the other huge piece of social emotional well-being is what we do just in the classrooms every day, um, especially through PYP, the learner profile traits are teaching them how to be good students and well-rounded citizens. In kindergarten and first grade, we have a couple of units that are focused on how to you know, get along with each other, how to be a part of a community, how our choices impact others. So at the early elementary level, we're teaching them a lot about just how to get along. And so that um, it directly impacts their social and emotional well-being because if they're feeling connected to their peers and connected to their community, that's a positive experience then for them at school. I think that is it for us. Oh, construction. What's special about us is the construction this year. Um, so I've been really proud that our teachers have 
forged ahead and made the experience exactly the same for the kids that it, it's always been. The kids really aren't missing out on anything aside from a cafeteria and maybe a gym, <laughs> but they are, they're having a great year. But things are coming along nicely. These are the latest from inside the site from our team as of last Friday. So you can see kind of some of the bricks actually going on that outer exterior on that bottom. That's the gym. Um, on that top panel, those are to hold the air conditioning units on top of the roof. Um, inside that top picture on the left, I believe, is the art room down in the basement. And then below that is the hallway going back to the art room. Um, the one next to that is the skylight that'll give the light down into the cafeteria. And then the one with all of the insulation on it is that back. That's the whole back of the school. So you can see just how large our addition is going to be when it's finished. But we're getting very excited. It's starting to look like a school. So it's been very fun for people to see and kind of imagine where their spaces are. The teachers are already requesting a tour, which is not quite safe yet, but <laughs> they will hopefully get to do by the end of the year to really see what the school's going to look like. And it's going to be going to be good. So we are coming along at Mount Daniel. Thank you very much, Mr. Swanson. All right. Well, thank you, and good evening, everybody. So at TJ, I think it may be helpful for us to begin with just a, a common understanding of what we mean by MTSS, multi-tiered systems of supports. It's really the umbrella to think about just our broad, what is it that we do relative to academics, relative to behavior, relative to social learning. And at TJ, there's been a whole host of initiatives this year. One of the things that we've done is to really leverage a new master schedule and one of the byproducts of that schedule is that we have created um, a really neat caveat where one day a week kids will have two encore classes and during that second encore class teachers will have collaborative team meetings and they will meet over all kinds of things generally speaking literacy numeracy PYP and then RTI the weekly meetings that we have on at-risk kids are precisely the MTSS structure that Aaron described at Mount Daniel. We're absolutely looking at at-risk kids, kids that are struggling, again, in all areas, and we're trying to devise uh, what are the best, most appropriate interventions on those kids. Each one of those meetings also starts with an admin meeting, and that's where we're really looking at our systemness. In other words, what are we telling teachers that we expect them to do as they walk away from that? I think that's an area where we've made, I think, a significant amount of growth, and we also still have some improvement that I think we can make there, but we're getting there. One of the things that I think we are most proud of at TJ is the significant progress that we have had, particularly with our PBIS initiatives. We are doing Tiger Stripes, which is our version of the Hippo Hooray. And at the end of this year, I think we will, assuming that the world does not collapse, we will have given out well over 3,000 Tiger Stripes over the course of the year. And I think one of the things that we've really tried to do this year, and Summer Manos has been, I think, very helpful on this front, is that we have not only given out those tiger stripes, but we've tried to marry those tiger stripes with other areas of the school where we feel like we can improve. For instance, when you look at our office referrals, not surprisingly, the data bears it out. Over 90% of our office referrals stem from playground incidents. And already we feel like we've turned the corner on that simply by trying to reinforce with kids positive behavior on the playground, handing out tiger stripes for the kids that are doing well, and then also really making use of our morning announcements to remind kids we want to practice being safe, responsible, and respectful. And here is what that will look like on the playground. Here's how we can be safe. Leave sticks on the ground. That's been particularly helpful for our kids. <laughs> and then one of the, the academic interventions that we have introduced this year is a program called RICU, Reading Intensive Care Unit. And our two reading specialists, Sarah Parrish and Shannon Evans, deserve enormous credit for this. This is a program that was um, sort of evolved from programs that we've seen at neighboring districts, and it is targeting kids 
that are below grade level, but but can really elevate themselves with just a little bit of help. And we have seen exponential gains. I think our first round of RICU was an eight-week run. We had somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 kids in that program, somewhere in the neighborhood. I think 15 of those kids, don't hold me to this, but I want to say 15, maybe it's 14 of the 17 jumped to almost being at grade level. It's a pretty remarkable feat, and our reading specialists deserve enormous credit for that. As my colleagues have said, we have given um, a lot of laser attention to special populations. Aaron referenced the shared professional development session that we did with Mount Daniel. What was particularly, I think, uplifting about that is that it is no secret that in the history of education, teacher PD is not always something that people warm, that people feel warm and fuzzy about. I will tell you that overwhelmingly the feedback, the feedback that we got from teachers was very, very inspiring on that. They were really engaged, felt like it was really well done. We've also given a lot of attention to special populations on those early release days. We have devoted an enormous amount of time dealing with multicultural issues, um, successfully teaching kids with disabilities, co-teaching, some of our ESOL LEAP kids and things like that. Um, and I think that we've made a lot of gains there. I think another thing that we did this year to really try to maximize our instruction is to just think really strategically even about class placements. We still have extreme diversity in every single one of our classes. But what we have found is that if we can take these three or four ESOL kids that show similar levels relative to to reading and DRA, if we can put those kids in the same classroom, it maximizes our chance that those kids can receive push-in services and basically be exposed to the same curriculum that everybody else is, but with a little bit of support. And this year we have co-teaching classrooms, general ed and special ed, in all four grade levels. And those are overwhelmingly, they are a sight to see. Uh, I have seen co-teaching done masterfully, and I've also seen it done uh, with mediocrity in the past. I would put all four of our grade levels up against any school and say that we are doing, we're doing it well. We have also given significant attention to our PYP programming. Uh, one of the things that we've done is that during that collaborative meeting time, one meeting a month is dedicated exclusively to PYP. We've got a lot of teachers that are working hard on planners, summative assessments, and things like that. In addition to that, teachers will also, just on their own personal planning times, a lot of those teachers are working individually and as a group on learning engagements, particularly some of the summative assessments. I think Aaron referenced this. We are finding that um, at some at some junctures, we feel like we're really hitting our stride with rubrics. In other cases, that's been kind of slow going simply because as we keep those planners fresh and we're doing, let's say, a summative assessment for the first time, sometimes it's a little hard to design a rubric because we don't know exactly how this is going to go. So after you do that summative assessment and you have one year in the book, making a rubric for kids is a little bit easier. And so I anticipate that that's something that that will continue. We also did another shared professional development uh, day with Mount Daniel, and we looked at our vertical alignment. In other words, what are we doing in PYP relative to kindergarten? What are we doing in first grade, third and fifth? And I think that was a really constructive use of time. What we found is there were some redundancies. For instance, we found that there were some real similarities in a common assessment that was done, I think maybe at fourth grade and another one that was done even at first. And so I think that day was helpful in really being able to just clean up some of the, the redundancies that we've seen. And lastly, but in my view not, not least, we have been very intentional about some of our hallway decor at TJ. I think it says something that when you walk in TJ and you walk into that main foyer, the first thing that you see is a list of learner profile traits. The second thing that you see is 
an abbreviated planner for second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. So it's a real statement that when you come in our school, this is a priority for us. This is who we are, and it's what we do, and it's what we believe. Like the other schools, we have really hit social and emotional work hard. My sense is that this has always been, I think, a strength at, at TJ, uh, and I think there's a lot of folks uh, that, that deserve a lot of credit for that. Uh, chief among them, probably Liz Germer. We have all grade levels receiving monthly counseling sessions uh, in class lessons on everything from bullying to collaborating to conflict resolution, diversity, all kinds of things. We have about half of our classrooms that are getting a little bit more intensive second step program. I think that's something that we're looking at expanding next year. Right now, a lot of that happens when there's just a collaboration between the teacher and counselors and teachers feel like I've got a classroom that could really benefit from a little bit of extra gear. We have widespread use of mindfulness, um, and that too, I think, has been very helpful, particularly with some of our kids that really struggle behaviorally. And I think one of the things that we have tried to message with our community is that there is, there's no shortage of test anxiety, I think, across the United States. And there's no question that we've got kids and families that rightfully take assessments like the SOL seriously. And we do too. But we've also really tried to message with kids and we've tried to message with parents that the output is really less important than the input. Just try your best and be mindful that this is one data point. This is one, it's not a final exam. There's nothing that's going to happen in third grade that is going to keep a child from getting into Harvard University. And, and we try to remind our kids of that. And then we, I think similar to that, we also have a fair number of small groups that work with our counselors on a whole host of emotional challenges, everything from anxiety to family separations to anger issues, attentional struggles, and, and all kinds of things. So when you put all of this together, everything that I've referenced thus far has been directly tethered to the triennial plan. And when you put all this together, by the end of this year, we anticipate that staff members will have held approximately, probably more than 180 meetings, professional development sessions, training sessions that directly support the FCCPS triennial plan. Uh, a point of clarification, 180 meetings in total. We don't have staff members going to 180 meetings. That would be, be a little on the overkill side. <laughs> One of the things that we sort of thought about relative to, I think, this presentation and what makes TJ unique is maybe some of our efforts that we have devoted to parent and community outreach. And when I came to TJ in listening to, I think, our community, it really became clear that this was an area that I think parents would, would really appreciate some attention given, and that's something that we've tried to do. One of the things that we have done at TJ is that we hold monthly chalk chats. And a chalk chat uh, is a 30 to 45 minute meeting with me. And I'll usually begin the meeting with, let's say, a three to five minute summary over some facet of what's happening at TJ. And then we use the remainder of that time as a town hall meeting. And we'll let parents ask any question that they want. That has been incredibly helpful. I think it's been helpful not only for parents, but it's been helpful for us as the building. It's given us a chance to really sort of get a pulse on what's going on in our parent community. I will tell you that some of those chalk chats have had direct positive um, implications for our master schedule. That has helped a lot. We have also really tried to make use of a tremendous resource here in FCCPS, the FCCPS or the Falls Church City television. And so Rob Carey, one of our assistant principals, has done a lot of really good work with the PYP Minute. Jeremy, I think, and Aaron have also done some similar things. We have also used that video communication with parents and our kids to even describe, for instance, some of our next school-wide Tiger Stripe 
rewards. Um, if you have never seen a second grader dance on video, you're really missing out on life. <laughs> One of the things that we did this year that we were, we were really proud of, uh, and we were grateful to do it, is that, uh, as we all know, Falls Church has a heavy service family population. We've got a very mobile com community, and when you look at military service, State Department service, we've got a lot of families that are coming in and out of our community, and they are undergoing sacrifices that I am absolutely going to say that I, I don't understand. I cannot imagine. But it's something that when you listen to some of our parents who will specifically tell you, my child had to go to school in an armored vehicle, that is something. That's a sacrifice. So one of the things that we did was that we held in the first semester, we held a service family appreciation night where the sole purpose of that event was to simply welcome those folks to our school, thank them for their service, allow them to meet other people that are in the same line of work as them, and then we also tried to prepare some flyers about the Falls Church community and, and where the nearest Bonchon Chicken is. <laughs> we also have an ongoing discussion at our school about consistent classroom newsletters. And this is something, again, it's an issue that we've witnessed firsthand, but we've also seen and heard about in chalk chats that we have some classrooms that might be sending out a newsletter once a month. We have some that might be once a week. And I think there's virtues to any number of schools of thought here. But I think one of the things that, that we would like to do and that I think our our parent community would like to see us do is to try to have a little bit more uniformity in how we communicate with families and also to ensure that we're really communicating proactively instead of telling families not only what we've done but let's also try to tell families where we're headed and what are some units that are coming up and then one of the things when we started this last year we've expanded it this year is that we have started uh, a bi-weekly digital newsletter and that will contain any number of items everything from some tips from some of our reading and math specialists about what can be done at home there's always a pyp minute in that uh, newsletter i'll usually have a column discussing some issue of the day and what we've heard from parents is that there's a lot of appreciation about about that level of communication so i think the the notion of of community outreach is it's a manifestation of our, our profound belief that ours is a partnership. We cannot do what we do without our parents. And so we want to make sure that we reach out to them and give them as much information about what's happening at our school as, as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're at the point of are there questions board members have? I'll go. Well, thank you all for great, pr great presentations. Um, just a quick question: but the central ideas that you mentioned, mm -hmm. what what are the cent what are central ideas? So that's the main part of a PYP unit of inquiry. So in PYP, there's six units that are the same in any PYP school. So um, how we organize ourselves is one of them, and then the main way you think about as a teacher how you're going to teach that unit is by creating a central idea. So the way we do that is we look at what content we have to teach and how it relates to that overarching idea of how we organize ourselves and then the teachers come up with a statement that tells them what they're going to learn, that would tell the students what they're going to learn. So it's kind of then every activity that goes into that unit is teaching the students back to that central idea. And in the ideal world, as Aaron said, a math lesson during that unit is going to be tethered to that broader idea of how we organize ourselves. The literacy lesson for that day will be tied back to how we organize ourselves. Uh, it's, it's some challenging work for our, our staff. It really is. It's a lot of thinking time, but they do it well. And then just uh, another question. What should we be thinking about with future triennial plans? Is this, I'm hearing that, that things seem to be 
well aligned, but, but as we go forward to the next iteration of the triennial plan, and anything we should be thinking about that would build on what you're doing? Um, I think that this year having kind of three distinct areas was helpful to kind of drive our focus. Um, and so I think that having kind of segments of what the goals are going to be instead of having, you know, a lot of goals that are an inch deep but a mile wide, really focusing in deeply on these three things has been helpful for teachers and for us to truly feel like we're able to, you know, we know what the focus is, we're able to really put our time into that and we can feel successful at what we're doing. So I think keeping that in mind as we're setting goals is important. Anything to add? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Mr. Castillo, and I think it's one that, frankly, the results of what we're doing now will steer us in whatever direction we need to go. For instance, we have math standards in Virginia that are still evolving. Uh, I think next year is, is a bridge year, I think, with maybe some reading standards. So I, I don't know that there is going to be a need necessarily to change a triennial plan. But I think that data will point us in a direction that we need to go. <coughs> and honestly, I think some of the feedback that we get from IB relative to some of our PY planners, I think PYP planners, um, I think that will steer us in in a constructive direction. Other questions? I have one. Um, I'm just curious, um, Mr. Farrar is taking on kind of a new role. How, how is that going to impact you at Mount Daniel? I mean, it's obviously less resource for you if he's doing something else. So the hope is that if the budget passes the way we intend, that we'll be getting a full-time PYP coordinator split between our two schools, and that's half of his job responsibilities. So. The idea was that it'll help us kind of bridge that gap between us and the preschool so that we can better prepare students for that transition and that he ideally would have a little more free time in his schedule to um, kind of go back and forth. And we've been trying it so far, you know, the past month, um, and it's taken a lot of communication between the two of us to make sure that everything is covered. But I feel like if we can do it now, then I think that is, especially if we get that coordinator and that piece is taken off of his plate, that it'll be... It'll be a good fit. And I mean, Rachel does a lot of what's going on over at the preschool, so they're in good hands no matter yeah. where he Commun is. Communication is key. Just um, me communicating with Aaron when I'm going to be out of the building, knowing in advance, and talking with Rachel, knowing what's going on over the course of a week, and making sure that I'm you know, not just leaving in the middle of a day without you know, having a plan in place for that. A Ms. Gale. A thank you. A follow-up question based on that, um, and this might be for Peter too. How does this impact the special education director's job? So, are we mm. taking that piece off of the special education director's plate? Ideally, if we get the PYP coordinator, Mr. Ferrara can help out at the preschool, and then the special education director kind of can. That's right. Not be all of that is okay, right. Okay. Yeah. I just to make sure that I had like all that. Yeah. Data. No. Okay. No. The intention was to. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, let me just let me let me just say that the job that Liz was doing, I think, was an impossible job because of the multiple facets of the the work that she did between special education, special services, which includes school counseling and health and wellness and everything else, and then the J JTP <coughs> piece uh, was just pulling her in so many directions. So that anytime someone Ch changes, leaves a system, whatever, I think we have to look at it from a systems perspective to identify are there opportunities here to make some realignments and some, some adjustments that would be appropriate. So we really felt like this was an opportunity to take advantage of a new director, key in on Jeremy and Rachel's leadership capacity and say to both of them, Rachel, you can do more <laughs> in leadership than what you're doing. And Rachel, just by the way, is about to get into uh, an administrative program at Virginia Tech, which we've just got our fingers <laughs> crossed. And, uh, and it also supports Jeremy's leadership, you know, rounding out his experiences at, in pre-K also. And then bringing in the new director of special ed and special services allows that person to really hone their skill in, and really communicate, I think, even more effectively in the job that they're doing. I, I think one of the things we're gonna face and the numbers of preschool students at JTP bear it out. 
how, uh, four years ago we had 14, and now we have 43 special ed kids at Jesse Thackeray. So talk about uh, not quite exponential growth, but huge growth over four years. Uh, it's not, uh, that's not a lagging indicator. <laughs> you know, that's a leading indicator of things to, to come. So we have to pay attention to those things. Um, if I can follow up on something you guys were just talking about, about um, bridging from one place to the next, both, Aaron, both you and, and Paul were talking about um, trying to find the, the ways to apply MTSS to get the least restrictive environment, the most involvement of the children in the in this mainline class. So I'm curious, you were talked about looking at PYP and looking at what sort of professional development and what sort of uh, going up and down across that boundary you do there. What about on the MTSS, and, and Rachel looking over in your direction too, sort of looking across the boundary of, of the different schools to make sure that there's as much professional development in common across that. How do you guys handle that? So if I understand your question correctly, I think what I hear you asking, Mr. Anderson, is to what extent do we have professional development that supports the triennial plan? Is that what I hear you asking? It's, a, it's I guess I'm trying to go a little bit further below that, perhaps, just to sort of how do you actually do professional development jointly, or to what extent do you do professional development jointly to support MTSS and the goals of the triennial plan across the three schools? How does that work? Yeah. We, I think this year, um, we've certainly done more this year, I think, than we did last year. We've had at least two sessions where we have had the entirety of the Mount Daniel staff and the TJ staff basically under the same roof. That by itself is no small accomplishment. And the, the things that were done there, in one case, we did um, the PYP vertical alignment. And then in the other case, we did a special populations training. And obviously, those are two real sweet spots for us. This year, um, I, to some degree, I think just even construction has maybe just been sort of an, an, a wrinkle to that that's maybe um, added some complexity to that. But I think it's something that we've seen has paid some dividends. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd like to do more of that. I think something else that we do is when we do have, say, a presenter coming in, like I spoke of the PYP training we did in the summer before school started, she came to us, and then the same presenter went to TJ. Um, we've done that when we've adopted new curriculums. We've had presenters do things with both schools. <coughs> um, it is actually helpful in those senses when you're focusing strictly on curriculum to have separate sessions, in my opinion, because when I've worked in, say, a K-5 school, the primary people are always the ones that are kind of along for the ride and all of the PD is more upper elementary focused. Um, so if you're talking about adopting a new math curriculum, it's very easy how to talk about doing that with, you know, second, third, fourth, and fifth graders and the kindergartners and first grade teachers are kind of feeling a little left out. So in some senses, it's good that we're our own entity because it really forces that consultant to focus on that primary level because that that's all they're talking to <laughs> um, but then i think that having time for both and like paul said us also working together is important um, to be honest we don't do a ton with you guys yet i think that preschool is a slightly different entity because their standards are different but um, especially with jeremy being in both places i think we'll we'll be more connected than we have been in the past for sure and I did go last year to a PBIS meeting mm -hmm. as Summer and I were sort of constructing the MTSS framework for JTP. Um, I think what I showed earlier, the pyramid model is different than what the older kids are using, mm -hmm. and that's simply because of developmental appropriateness. Um, and it's what the state is sort of looking at, that pyramid model for preschool. So trying to bridge those gaps and maybe starting to use Jeremy to talk about some of those skills, the three-step model, is that yeah. what it is, method, um, and maybe bringing that down to preschool. So I think that's a place we can grow. Ms. Russell? Oh, yeah, follow up, Ms. Barron. Just saying thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, from what I understand in the past, there's been kind of a, I guess, a disconnect between Mount Daniel and TJ in terms of the PYP program 
and I know that um, people express that it's kind of like two years of Mount Daniel and then like a stop and then TJ and it kind of is almost like a whole different program to some extent. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of progress in terms of bridging that gap. And I'm just curious, like what areas do you see that you need to continue to work on? Um, ones that I think you feel like you've really nailed and then how the new, hopefully, PYP shared coordinator will be able to help with your progress going forward. Um, one thing actually we did this year, uh, which was I think the first time we had done this in a long time, we had our uh, PYP steering committees from both schools spend actually an entire day in here uh, trying to bridge that gap. And uh, we looked at the action, we looked at uh, the rec when the PYP came, um, when IB came, I guess, three years ago now, they made a lot of recommendations and we sat in this room with both committees and looked through all the recommendations from Mount Daniel, all the recommendations from TJ, lined them up because we knew there'd be some similarities. And then <clears throat> the, uh, part of the day we did that jointly with Mount Daniel and TJ teachers together and then we split and did a little bit some to find some of the separate recommendations that were for each individual school. So I think that helped um, the PYP leaders of the school kind of get on the same page with uh, how our programs were running. And I, I thought, I think that was really helpful for both. Questions? Mr. Castillo? So one of the things that struck me while you all were talking was there's this criticism of schools as being a holdover from the 19th century and it's just a factory that ranks out future factory workers and, and everybody goes into the same classroom and they all learn the same thing. And what, what struck me is how much variation and individual attention there is. And is there some way to, to understand what component of, you know, there's the, the, there's the regular classroom environment and then there are all these additional pull-out, push-in services that are being provided. Is there some way of understanding the, the relative proportions and just how important the, and, and widespread the customization is so that people kind of get a better, more nuanced understanding of what's going on? Is it like 60-40? Is it like 70-30? How, how do you explain more in a more nuanced way that this isn't just people moving from classroom to classroom? And, and yeah, I, it's a hard question to answer because there's, there's a lot of layers to what you're talking about. For instance, at TJ, we have somewhere in the neighborhood about 819 kids in the building as a whole. <coughs> somewhere in the neighborhood, about 115 of them have IEPs uh, and 504s. So each one of those kids is really going to be differentiated based on what's on their IEP. I would argue, though, that, uh, and, and I absolutely hear what you're saying, the old notion that we, that we just mass produce these kids coming out of schools. I think if you were to even take a cursory look at FCCPS, that dog just ain't gonna hunt. It's just not. And I think our instructional package itself is a differentiation. For instance, when you walk in any one of our buildings, there's not going to be many times that you're going to see whole class instruction. And if you do, it's probably going to be a 10 to 15 minute mini lesson. And then kids are breaking up in small groups and they're doing independent rotations, they're doing guided math. There's a group of four or five kids that are working with the teacher on individualized, personalized lessons. So I think that that baseline academic instructional program really bites into that old notion of what schools do. At Jesse Thackeray, the kids are in the classroom pretty much 100% of the time unless they're getting like 15 minutes of speech or a half hour of speech or whatever it is. Um, but the speech and OT and PT often push into the classroom, so they're a part of what's going on in the classroom setting. Um, so for us, it's they're they're there for lunch. They're there for everything. <laughs> I just find that for me, it's just uh, definitely impressive. Just hearing just how over a four year period at JTP, the the growth of those special needs students there, um, and just having how to address those students. And again, it's just 
makes I, I appreciate how at every level of our schools those students are worked with accommodations are made for them that with Thackeray in particular that students with those special um, needs are integrated into the classroom versus kind of made to stand out and, and be taught in a different way. Um, yes, they get those additional services, but they are in the classroom with everyone else, so they're not made to feel that they're different in any any capacity. And I think that's a, a great testament because a lot of students are in other districts potentially pulled out and taught separately. And I think that's a good thing for us that we don't do that. Um, it's also just the work that the transition that we have in between our our elementary and preschool continues to get better and better, um, particularly on the, the PIP front, that uh, as we get the coordinator, fingers crossed, it'll make that process even more seamless as um, we race towards that uh, excellence of the um, premier IB program and starting right at that level is just where we get that hit the ground running at there. So, but yes. Can I just say one mm -hmm. thing to that too? It's very cool that we are able to educate sort of the spectrum of mm -hmm. kids in the preschool setting and that we can have tuition tiers because most systems don't have a preschool setting for typically developing tiers. They either have Head Start or they have special ed and that's it. So it's it's really a very neat model and it's really cool to see in this city that that's how we value our education. And I never get mad when I get caught behind when all the little ones are getting on the bus, mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. sitting and waiting for the, they want to get on the bus and wait until they go down Cherry Street, so. You better uh, not get mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just put my car in park, they're going to get on there, and I'll be on the way eventually. Or if I have to be in a hurry, just go back the other way. <laughs> yeah. uh, but thank you all very much, and Dr. Nimi, just just to comment? final comments just to one um, hopefully tonight it's it's evident what great leaders we have in the city of Falls Church schools um, and one of the things that I have I have said well I discovered when I came in and I think I heard it from a lot of people sort of in my listening tour this first year is um, if you were just to come in and take a look at the system of city of Falls Church schools we were um, a system of schools and not a school system. And so one of the things that I want to become really tight about and have sort of said to everyone I'm going to be really tight about is that we're going to work interdependently and we're going to rely on each other and have an articulated curriculum from pre-K to 12. And I think what um, the, th the leaders that you see in front of you have been able to do this year is not only build learning systems for their students, but also learning systems for the adults uh, in that sharing resources back and forth, learning from each other, listening to the staff and hearing what the needs are and being able to say, um, Here, here's the plan for professional development for all of us so that we can get better at what we're doing and serve the needs of our kids is, uh, is incredible. And so we, we now have sort of made this pre-K five marriage work <laughs> and now we, and, and we've made this, so, uh, 612 work and so next year the challenge will be to bring everybody together so that we can truly say we are um, pre-k 12 uh, and not for nothing uh, that PYP coordinator that would be half time at Mount Daniel and half time at Thomas Jefferson is actually um, being uh, in the current structure that we've put together paid for by the by the efficiencies and the savings that we have found within our system already so if um, we are able to get the money from the council to do our COLA and to do enough for also a psychologist, we have already found the money through efficiencies and restructuring on the school side to pay for the PYP coordinator. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than fingers crossed on that one because I feel like we've, we've done a good job scrubbing our budgets to realign our resources to meet the needs of the system. Thank you all very much um, for you. all that you do and look forward to speaking on behalf of everyone to get around to, to see you all in action in your buildings. Thank you all very much. School night.
We will move on to 8.02, approval uh, first reading of the policy GFCD weapons in schools. I'm going to turn it right over to Trish Minson. Good evening. Um, policy JFCD is one that was adopted at the last meeting um, last month and then at the work session on the 20th we discussed um, minor changes to the policy. So for first reading today uh, the only proposed changes are um, and I should have put the line numbers on the side but on line four down from the first paragraph removing at designated bus stops and then adding the language that appears in red um, adding stun weapons um, as weapons that are prohibited on school campus. Um, that language was taken from our policy on staff weapons, which I hope to bring before the board at the, for first reading at the next board meeting. Okay. Thank you very much, Art. Any questions? If none, um, yes, Mr. Casillo. I'm sorry, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so I hope you'll indulge me and my screen just blanked out. I think the second line uh, discussing it's it's weapons in unopened containers or something. What, what is the relation? Oh, yes, yeah, so unloaded firearms in closed containers. What, why would it matter if it's in an open container? Or what, why wouldn't you just say unloaded firearms? That's a good question. This language comes directly from the Virginia Code of, of Weapons. Um, and I know that our previous policy at 9.28 had allowed um, firearms that were in closed containers and not loaded to be on school premises. So this policy um, changes that and says that that is included as a weapon that is prohibited on school grounds. Does that answer Why your question? Why wouldn't you just say unloaded firearms, period? Whether they're in open containers or closed containers? That's another change that we could make. I, I don't see any problem with, with changing that. Let me look real quick at the Virginia Code on its definition of weapons. We don't have to do this. I just throw that out there because, I mean, if you have an unloaded weapon in an open container, are you good? No, because it likely <laughs> would still qualify as an other <coughs> firearm um, or a revolver or a stun weapon under here. And, or an air rifle or a look-alike gun. So I don't think that the open or closed nature of the container impacts its um, qualification as a weapon under this policy. Any other questions or comments? Just ask. <laughs> no guns and Tupperware. All right. Um, so what I would propose tonight is so that we can um, like we did last time, move the policy on to replace what's there that we put kind of quickly into place with the new modified language and waive first reading and move to second and adoption. Uh, if there's no objection to that, there is language in here of one of the two uh, recommended actions if, uh, for that, if, if, if we're okay with that. And if we are, if someone would. Uh, I'll make, move, a make a motion. Um, I move that the school board waive first reading and approve and adopt second reading of policy JFCD weapons in school as presented. A second. second. Thank you, Ms. Russell. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Right. Thank you very much. And next we have the uh, VSBA. Business honor roll, which I have. Okay. All right, so we have a uh, the VSB business honor roll, and we are recognizing uh, the Hilton Garden Inn. And Hilton Garden Inn, Todd Holt at Kinder Capital, and Mark Home. All right, so resolution reads. Um, whereas public schools and local businesses are integral parts of this community and whereas many local businesses play a critical role in supporting our schools and whereas the economic health of our community, state, and nation depends on a strong public school system and whereas collaboration between local public schools and local businesses strengthens schools and the business community alike by providing a well-trained and highly educated workforce and whereas an excellent public school 
system is vital to the quality of life in this community and fundamental to preserving a strong democratic society now and in the future. Therefore, be it resolved, the Falls Church City School Board names Hilton Garden and Falls Church, Todd Hitt, Kinder Capital, and Marcone to the 2018 Virginia School Board Association Business Honor Roll, showing appreciation for their ongoing support of the school of this community, community's public schools. Your work with aid has aided this community in focusing on the goals of providing the best public schools we can to every child who attends them. So, uh, that I will uh, sign resolution and we'll pass it around to everyone else. Do you want to pass it? Oh, excuse me. So I will take a motion to accept this. <laughs> Mr. Ch Mr. Yes. Chair, I, uh, Sorry. I move that the Falls Church City Public School Board adopt resolution 02-18, the 2018 VSBA business honor roll as presented. Thank you very much, a second. I second. Thank you, Ms. Litton. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Now I'll sign it and pass it around. <laughs> All right, and we'll move on to uh, 8.04, the budget adjustment request for daycare. Dr. Newman. Yes, thank you. Um, we have a couple of items that are um, more uh, cleanup items than anything else, just to sort of get some money straightened out to make sure that it's in the right pot for um, spending. So we've got the date, we've got something for daycare, um, a budget adjustment there, one for an uh, advise a position conversion, um, and then also we're going to talk a little bit about buses. Um, Kristen Michael has these three um, different uh, topics, so I will turn it over to her for 8.04, 5, and 6. Seven. And seven. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening. The first item that we have is for our Community Services Fund. Our FY19 budget included using funding from daycare's available balance, so their year-end balance from prior fiscal years, to purchase new playgrounds for both Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson. Um, a as we've previously discussed, both of those playgrounds are very much in need of replacement. Right, they've really exceeded or gotten to the end of their useful life. So as part of that budget proposal, we had included using that one-time available funding from the daycare program to replace them, right, being an appropriate expenditure because those playgrounds truly benefit the daycare students um, as well as will Im improve our schools um, and serve the students in both of those locations. So when we looked at that proposal, it was for FY19, which is July, and those playgrounds we want to replace over the summer. So when we started working with the vendors for playgrounds in order to get on their schedule for this summer, they need us to commit to making those purchases now. So we need to initiate that purchase order to replace the playgrounds in order to get in the summer queue. So if we wait until after the FY19 budget is appropriated, we may miss our turn in the queue and we could risk not getting them done over the summer. Right? And we think it's really critical that they're both ready to go for next school year. So what we're requesting here is we have the available funding in the ending balance, right? We were going to use that from the FY19 budget. So on page two of this document, what you see in the chart is we're taking the funding from, in this case, the title of the account code is investments, but it's from our available balance. And what we have to do is we have to recognize that funding that we're going to use it, and then we deposit into our revenue account. And then from there, we can increase our expenditure appropriation so we have the ability to spend it. So basically, that funding is currently not included in our budget, right? So we're going to recognize that we have it available to spend, and then we'll go ahead and we would like to place those purchase orders now. In the event that we do this, then when we adopt the FY19 budget, we'll take that funding request out of FY19. So we're just asking for your authority to spend it sooner. Then the second component is when the city council gives us the authority for our budgets, right, they give us an appropriation level, a total level of expenditures. And because we're going to increase these expenditures in 18 in order to initiate these purchases early, we also have to go back and then ask them to adjust that bottom line appropriation, right? It is the school board's funding and the ability to spend it, um, but through the budget process in Virginia, 
um, the governing body, which is typically the city or the county government, um, as part of their budget because we're a component unit when you look at the financial reporting, right, they will have to increase our appropriations. We would send this to them asking them to increase the total amount that we'll be spending for the daycare program in 18, which is earlier than we had previously discussed. So with this agenda item tonight, we also posted the playground designs. So what you see is a schematic drawing that looks at the playground from above, and then we have two different views for each playground. Um, they're slightly confusing because you're looking at the playground not only from different angles, but also from different zoomed in levels. So it really is just two different views. And when we look at the playgrounds, Mount Daniel used a committee approach, so it had the principal and other members from the school and daycare. And then at Thomas Jefferson, it was really the principal who worked um, with daycare and facilities for those playground designs. So the first motion that we have tonight is to ask um, the school board to approve us utilizing this funding in FY18 so we can <coughs> go ahead and place these orders early. So I think we'll pause and if we could discuss that before I move into the next issue, if that's okay. Questions, anyone? So Ms. Russell first, then Mr. Castillo. Uh, forgive me if this is sounds crazy but so what I hear you saying is that we're basically asking to increase for FY18 so that's ultimately going to decrease our budget request for FY19 I mean I know it's just moving the money it is but so how's that gonna sure it's not part of our request to the City Council because this truly is school board's money that's within the daycare fund but what we're asking is we had included an increase of 400,000 in our FY19 budget request to replace these playgrounds. So what we're doing is we're accelerating the timing and asking to increase the expenditures in FY18. Right, I understand and that, but on paper, it will look like a decrease in the FY19 budget. When we adopt the FY19 budget, you are correct. It will be 400,000 lower than it. it was presented to the school board in January, correct? In, in the daycare account. Right, in the, in in the, the daycare, daycare account. Not the operational moving, account. Yeah. But on paper, that's what it's gonna. Correct, and the truth is these expenditures are still going to post in FY19 because we're not gonna actually make the payments to the vendor um, until the playground is complete. But in order to go ahead and make the purchase order to give that request to buy it, we have to have the ability to spend the money to place our request. Um, so in the end, while the FY19 budget is gonna decrease the actual expenditures when they're posted, uh, will likely fully be in FY19. So my question is, this is not not this is not in the operating budget. This is not. This is in the community services okay. fund, and it's the daycare budget. So <coughs> this is special, a special revenue fund. The revenue comes from the fees that they charge to program participants. So this will not in any way impact the operating budget. But this is, the, the, the last box talks about funding added to capital replacement. So does this touch CIP or no? It doesn't. So when we look at our, when we think of our, fund structure, the organization is really the who. So who's spending the money? And when you look at the object, that's really what the money is being spent on. So objects include things like teacher salaries or instructional materials. So in this case, the object is that capital replacement. And it's a capital replacement because the value of the playground exceeds $5,000. So when you look at our comprehensive annual financial report that the city prepares, these playgrounds are a capital asset. So that's why you see them in capital replacements as the what for the expenditure. Okay, but so why wouldn't this be in the CIP then? So when you look at the CIP, the capital improvement plan, you're correct in that we could have put this in the capital improvement plan as a request previously in terms of that expenditure and built that through that process. Um, but it wasn't identified as an expended need, um, so it didn't work through that process. Um, because this funding is a special revenue fund for the daycare program, this really is an expenditure of that fund, that program. Um, so that's why we're making this purchase through that fund. But an, another option would have been for us to include this in our long-term CIP and build this into that planning process and work through that fund. But the funding would have come from the same source. The, the difference is, I, I think, in this particular circumstance, because it's a community services fund, there's much more flexibility than having to work it through the full CIP. Yes, right. yes, absolutely. 
Okay, and then just one last question with respect to the Mount Daniel mm -hmm. playground. I, I assume the schedule is aligned to do this when it needs to be done? Correct. So we've been working each week. We have a planning meeting with the construction team at Mount Daniel. Um, they are fully aware of this request, and we've really been working on that summer plan, which includes activities inside the school and the exterior. So yes, we are um, fully working with the construction company and our owner's representative there to ensure the timing of this um, will not in any way impact the school. Mr. Anderson? And, oh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Michael, I just want to make sure 100% clarity of the language that says requires a corresponding city appropriation increase. This is not require uh, not requesting an increase in the city transfer requesting authority to spend funds that already exist in this in the daycare fund but at a level that's higher than the original budget resolution that is absolutely correct we're not asking for an increase in funding from the city we're simply asking for their authority to expend the funds that we already have okay thank you mm -hmm. any other questions yes. what, has this been socialized with the general government so yes, we met actually um, last week. Um, we've been meeting every single Friday with staff from the city general government to go over our interactions together and things that we can do better. And we worked through this with them last Friday. Great. Okay. Okay. So that was the first thing. So there's a motion there. I don't know <coughs> if you want to vote on that before I go to the next one. Mr. Chair, I move that the Falls Church Public School Board approve the amendment of the 2017-18 School Community Services Fund budget to allow the use of fund balance to increase revenues and expenditures by $459,771, which requires a corresponding city appropriation increase, allowing for the initiation of the process to replace the playgrounds at Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson Elementary Schools as included in the fiscal year 2019 budget proposal. Thank you, Mr. Pierre. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. So the second item regarding the daycare fund is when you look at the daycare fund, traditionally they've had a mix of what we call time card employees, so hourly employees, as well as they've had some what we call PAR or contracted employees. So when you look at that mix, daycare has always had a much larger number of employees that were paid via time card, hourly employees, right? And up until this year, that has really worked well in terms of being able to recruit staff. Um, but we found this year is that we're having difficulty in terms of filling the morning hours, right? So daycare has really been working to try to find a solution where we can ensure we have consistent coverage at every single school, meaning we have the same employees that are there in the morning every morning. So their proposal is that we take funding that's used to pay time card employees. So in a sense, take that hourly salaries. And that we're asking the board to allow us to have position authority so we could hire contracted positions that would receive benefits. So in this case, the employees would still work the same number of hours, which is six hours a day. They work two hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon, which would mean six hours a day. So they're an 80% employee. Right, but by making them permanent contracted employees, they would be eligible to, to participate in employee benefits. Right, so we believe that this is going to help both in terms of recruitment and retention. And we're asking for the authority to add six positions to the daycare fund. Again, there's no operating budget impact at all. The cost of the benefits for these six people, assuming that they all participate in some level of health care, which they might not, um, would be $24,000, and those costs would be completely covered by daycare fees that are charged to parents. So we're asking for this authority. We really think it will help us in terms of that recruitment and retention and also the consistency and coverage um, so we can ensure we have the same people there. So these six positions, we would spread over the sites to ensure that coverage. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there questions? Mr. Castillo. But, but there's no free lunch, right? So if you if you do this, you'll be spending more than you used to be. And if so, does that mean fees for daycare would have to go up? Or what, what would be affected as a result? Sure. So when we look at the daycare program, um, we brought it a previous board meeting, the fees for next year back to the school board. And the fees for next school year are held level with this year. 
Um, so daycare meets regularly with their advisory committee. They've been looking at their revenue and their expenditures. And certainly based on the revenue and the expenditures that they've had, they'll be able to fully cover this cost without increasing any additional fees. Right, so they are generating enough revenue to cover this. Um, one of the things when you look at the program this year is they've actually had a waiting list for morning coverage. And in part, part of that challenge has been ensuring that we have enough staff to cover in the morning. Um, so we really do think that this is going to help that program. And eventually, of course, if we have a waiting list and we have more staff that we're able to hire, I mean, hopefully we could decrease the number of students on the waiting list by accepting more students into the program. So potentially we could end up generating more revenue in the long run. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there no additional questions? If someone would uh, <laughs> make a motion, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the Falls Church City Public School Board approve the amendment of the 2019 School Community Services Fund budget to <coughs> convert hourly funding allocated to time card employees to five PAR positions. Thank you very much, Ms. Gill. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Litton. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next item that I have on the agenda um, is 8.06. Um, this is acceptance of grant funding and authorization to initiate a bus lease. So I want to recognize the efforts of our transportation staff, led by Nancy Hendrickson, um, who applied to get rebate funding from the Environmental Protection Agency. So this funding allows school districts that have old buses um, to receive a rebate to help them replace the buses with new clean diesel buses in their place. Part of that agreement um, when you get that funding from the EPA is they allocate up to $20,000 per bus and that funding has to be used for the purchase or the lease purchase of a new bus and you have to take the old bus out of service so you're not allowed to retain it. Um, so they were very excited about winning this award. Um, kudos to them for all of the effort that they put forward to get this. Um, and the grant that we received would allow us to replace up to three buses using this funding. So they would give us $20,000 per bus. When we look at the cost of a bus overall, a bus is somewhere about $120,000. So it would fund that $20,000 of the $120,000 in expenditure. Right. So this is super great funding, but there is a cost that goes with it. Right. So if you look at the back of page two on this agenda item, one of the things that I included with this agenda item is a total list of their bus fleet. Right. Our goal with our bus fleet is to replace our buses when they're 12 years of age. And we currently have 25 buses in our fleet. So just trying to do some really simple math, if we can assume we have 12 buses and we want to replace our 24 buses and we want to replace them every two years, Ideally, for a sustainable model, every single year we would be buying two buses, right? And we would keep that funding consistent in order to smooth the impact to our budget. Because once we got funding in our base budget for that level each year, we wouldn't need to increase or decrease that funding unless, of course, the cost of purchasing the buses went up, right? When you look at that increase each year. When we look historically at how we've purchased buses in the past, we've used a mixture of both lease purchasing buses, that's what we've done for the four most recent buses that we've purchased, but prior to that we were also using um, dollars to outright purchase buses. So if we got to the end of a fiscal year and we had funding available, we would outright purchase buses. So this chart on page two is sorted showing us our oldest buses at the top and our newest buses at the bottom, and it shows their age of service. So the three that are eligible for um, this $20,000 grant for the EPA are highlighted in that blue shade at the top. If we were to purchase those three buses, right, that ongoing cost that we would have each year if we lease purchased them would be about $70,000 a year. Right, so in year one, we would have $60,000 in grant funding. Right, but then in year two, we would need to fully fund that $70,000. So when we look at our FY19 budget proposal that's before you, there was $25,000 included in that budget to cover the cost of either one new bus or potentially to replace a van. So when we look at our ongoing funding moving forward, although we were eligible to receive three rebates from the EPA, my recommendation is that we go ahead and we purchase two buses and utilize funding for two of these buses. It falls in line with purchasing two buses each year. And when we look at our most recent buses, I think we can really smooth that out as we try to develop that sustainable model 
over the next few years. Few years. Um, if we purchase two buses, when you look at that ongoing funding each year, um, that cost would drop to about 50000 a year, and we have 25000 that we've already included in the budget proposal for FY19. So that would obligate the school board as we're thinking about that FY20 budget to increase spending by another $25,000. So while I'm really mindful that the transportation staff would love to have three buses, we're certainly in this recommendation that I'm giving you not taking full advantage of that EPA funding, but I'm also being really mindful as we look to the FY20 budget, all of the other cost drivers that the board is going to face as we have to develop that budget, right? Enrollment increases, salary increases for employees. So I really feel like this is a solid recommendation. For the EPA grant, we need to make our bus purchases by May. Um, so we really need your authority in terms of moving forward, which is why I'm bringing it to you this evening. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Are there <coughs> questions? Oops. So, down. so the, uh, the, the 2000 safety liner looks like a real cream puff with only 66,000 <laughs> miles. <laughs> And I guess that just raises a question, what's more important with these buses, their age or their mileage, or is it a little of both? And are we, are we paying, it looks like there's quite a bit of variation in mileage among the fleet. Yes. And should we be trying to level that a little bit more? And uh, I, I guess that you should spend as much money on these buses that you kind of know you're going to replace anyway. And if enrollment goes up a little bit more, does that mean another bus? Should we be a little aggressive and get or operating? How do operating costs fit? I, I guess you've thought all that stuff out, but I, I truly appreciate the questions. Um, we really have spent time really trying to think this through. Obviously, when you look at the long term, we have multiple things that we want to take into consideration, right? We look at the potential or the future move of second grade students that are going to be going from Thomas Jefferson to Mount Daniel, right? And what implications that has. Right, we look at the construction of the new high school and any potential impact to parking during construction and then after construction. We've also, as part of our goals, when you look at the superintendent's goals and us assessing our operations, we've been assessing the walking distance, right, and where we have students that are walking to school, where we could increase that, what things we would want to do to ensure student safety, and where we have opportunities. Right, those opportunities in terms of savings in the future could be looking at things like walking distance, we can look at things like our bell schedule, right? And if we staggered the start times of Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson, we could gain transportation efficiencies, right? Because right now they start at the same time, so we need drivers going to each school versus if we staggered them, potentially we could have one set of drivers make three runs, right? One for middle high school, then one for whichever elementary started first and then the last. So we've really trying, been trying to think through all of those things. Um, transportation regularly monitors capacity in our buses, right? We know our buses are full, um, but we also know that when you look at our walking distances compared to surrounding districts, right, we are busing many more students um, than surrounding districts and many more than we have to based on the Code of Virginia. When you look at the buses and the mileage, which is another fantastic question, when you look at on the far right column the notes, that shows what the buses are generally used for. So you can see all of the newer buses, they're using for those regular runs every day. You'll see, you know, um, all of their bus routes are labeled by letter. And then you have those spare buses at the top. Um, I think we do need to figure out how to be more mindful about many of our athletic events are farther distances. And are we sending the same buses on those longer trips? Those are highway miles, right? So. They are. Those are <laughs> highway miles. But really thinking about swapping them out, right, and ensuring we're not taking the similar buses back and forth. Um, the other components that impact which buses we use have to do with features on the bus. So you'll notice this one bus here, it's bus number 20. Um, that's a spare lift bus, right? So that bus is really separate from the other spare buses. Then the other component we've really been looking at that I've been looking at is, is I feel we have a lot of spare buses compared to our fleet. And when you look at best practices as well. Now I know we're using many of these buses. Again, I think a lot has to do with how we're scheduling the timing and even what the timing of our athletic events are in terms of how they are coming at the corresponding times of our late buses at middle and high school. 
So I think as we work forward and look at our growing enrollment, some of our boundary changes, we really want to work to assess all of those walking distances, but we want to have a really thorough conversation with the school board and the community. Right, so I feel like at this point in time, taking the two buses is the safest when I look at our expenditure increases that we have to face going into 2020, but we definitely leaving our, our leaving funding on the table. Um, one last thing, when you look at the buses that we're driving every day, right, you can see that those daily buses, the oldest in that group, is really about eight years old. Um, so we really are in a fortunate place in terms of we have a young fleet. In the last couple of years, we really have been able to buy many buses. Um, in general, our buses that are making those daily routes, because our city boundary is small, right, they aren't generating a lot of mileage. So the other piece that I think we should assess long term is, is that 12-year average really appropriate for the types of miles that we're driving? <coughs> so one last related piece is transportation is piloting some software that's diagnostic software that actually connects to the bus engines and really looks at that performance data to help ensure that we're maintaining them and getting the most out of them. So we're waiting to try that pilot and we also think that might help us in terms of bus longevity as well. There's a lot. These diesel that. buses are legit, right? They don't These are not cheating buses. On no, them. no, no, no. <laughs> These are le legitimate diesel buses, right? All right, well, sounds like you've thought it through, so thank you. And in terms of the funding um, that we've put in this FY19 budget, right. um, because of the work of alignment from the Triennial Plan around operations and the work that Kristen is doing to find efficiencies in operations, uh, we've been able to fund that portion of the transportation budget with those efficiencies. Again, another thing that we're not asking the City Council for money for. That those, were, that, those dollars were found through efficiencies on the school side. Any other questions? I guess I have a quick one, and it's maybe more Dr. Nanny. Uh, have we, for those trips for athletics and other events, have we, because I know other jurisdictions do the quote, activity buses mm -hmm. that tend to do that, have we ever thought about potentially buses for we, that purpose? Um, I, I think that we have. I think that there's been a recent um, attorney general opinion in the state of Virginia, actually, that took effect last week around Class A activity buses where they changed the requirement for the drivers to become very restrictive in that a driver used to be if you had a Class A bus and you were the baseball coach and you were going on the road, you could hop in the Class A bus and you could take your baseball team because it would seat 12 students or 15 students um, with a, a regular driver's license. Now the licensing requirement for um, drivers to drive that Class A bus, it requires an S certification and there are a number of school systems across Virginia that are reeling from that um, because they're, they just don't have enough drivers to be able to, to manage those class A buses and their other buses so um, so one of the things that we have talked about is you know does it make sense as, as Miss Michael sort of suggested does it make sense for us to continue putting our own fleet on the road or does it make sense just to get a charter bus because you pay a one-time fee for a charter bus, it doesn't impact the longevity of your fleet and in the long run could actually save us some money um, because, of, in, because of the associated costs. So, um, and, and the length of the drives that we take because of the nature of our school system can oftentimes be quite long. So those are some things that we're continuing to um, observe and, and look at and try to find some efficiencies around. Yeah. And that was going to be my next question because about uh, of charter bus usage. Mm. So I believe we do, you do that some for some. Uh, athletic events for those, for the, I guess the longer going to Southwestern Virginia and places like that, yeah. those would be a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Sort of dependent on, on the trip. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, I will entertain a motion, please. Actually, can I just ask one more yep. question? Go ahead. So what is the fully loaded cost of a bus? Because a bus means a driver and... So it's not just the acquisition cost of a bus, right? <clears throat> Correct, it's not. And you also have to look at, when we look at bus drivers, it's also very dependent upon the scheduling, right? Um, it's challenging for transportation to hire someone to just drive for an hour or two, right? So you also have to look at, are we just adding time to a driver or for hiring a whole new driver? Um, you know, most of our drivers are driving about five hours a day, so we have to factor that cost in as well. 
Right, so I think really as we move forward, continuing to assess our enrollment and all of those walking boundaries um, are, are going to be a continual opportunity to look at how we can ensure that we're getting the absolute most out of um, what we're doing with our transportation dollars. And, and I just but yes, the full cost of a bus is really buying the bus itself. We have to put fuel in the bus. We have to maintain the bus, right? We have to get the bus inspected and then we have to, you know, pay for the cost of owning the bus as well. And are we putting cameras on these new buses? Or are we taking the cameras off the old buses? What's so typically the new buses are going to come with cameras and GPS features. One of the things they are looking at in terms of these buses is one of the two buses, they'll buy seats that have integrated car seats in them. Um, and they'll buy more th than they need because then they'll be able to switch out those seats with some other buses. And that's less expensive than replacing the seats and buses we currently have. And, so that's that, and that's important for Thackeray. Yep. Instead of having to load all the other kids' individual car seats in, which we're currently doing, having them built in is significantly easier. Right. They've really been trying to so be. We won't be stuck on Cherry Street for <laughs> so long. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, it's funny. I was just thinking, I'm like, that's why it takes so long. Yes, <laughs> yes. So transportation is really trying to be thoughtful in terms of looking at um, this is an opportunity not only to get two new buses, but a, a way to serve the fleet as a whole. Ms. Lynn, did you have a question? I just had a quick question. When we retire a bus, do we own those or lease those? So do we do we sell them? What a happens fantastic to Fantastic question. So the buses that we have financed, we've used a lease purchase methodology. That's what they call it. We're really not leasing them. We're really buying them with payments over time. But the nomenclature they use is lease purchase. So we own the buses. When you look at these buses at the end of their useful life, they're really not worth a lot of money. Right, so, so typically you would go ahead and you would surplus it and sell it, um, but the dollars that you get from them are very minimal. You know, maybe $1,000 for a bus. The schools aren't looking to buy really old buses. But it'd be a kind of a cool partridge family. <laughs> thing, right? exactly. I, mean, I mean, I might want one to like go on vacation, <laughs> take <to> friends. <laughs> um, I, I know, uh, too, when I worked in Fairfax, we used to sometimes donate our buses, right? They could get donated to the police or fire department for training because the residual value is so low or, uh, or other things. Um, but the challenge is, right, people are really looking for newer buses that have better safety features. Um, when, you, when you think of the new buses, they also, you know, are burning much cleaner diesel. They could be getting better mileage. So there's really not a great market for used buses, right? They often have rust, you know, other things. So... Uh, I will entertain a motion, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the Falls Church City Public School Board approve the request to initiate the lease purchase of two new school buses, accepting the clean diesel rebate funding from the EPA to offset the first year's lease payment cost, with the balance to be paid from the funding included in the FY 2019 budget proposal. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. So my very last item, 8.07, the status of FY19, tuition students in grade 1, 5, and 8. Um, each year, um, what has been brought to the school board is a list of students that are moving from one school to the next that are tuition paying students. So students are coming in um, as grade 1 students, students that are moving on to middle school or high school. So when you look at this report for this year, you'll see that we have none. All of our tuition paying students are in the high school. Um, so this memo is just coming to the board for your information and no action needs to be taken. Thank you very much. All right, uh, 9.1, uh, are there any folks who have any future agenda items that they'd like to, to add or discuss? Okay. Yes, sir. I'll be that guy. I just took just uh, two quick questions. Is the mid-year review for Dr. Noonan in the calendar? I will check with uh, Mr. Reidinger on that. Okay, and then the other the other thing is, in, in terms of uh, school safety and guns, I'm glad to see that we, we took action tonight. I, anything else in the pipeline in terms of, for example, the facility study results and mm -hmm. further action? We've created um, a, a, a three um, a curriculum of three work sessions, essentially, that will address 
um, school safety, and the first one will be at the next work session that you all will have that will talk about current practices that are in place, uh, both from a physical school perspective and also from an emotional and wellness perspective. Um, the second one will be addressing what are the best practices that are out there um, and identifying the gaps between what do we currently do, what are those best practices, and the third is going to be around how do we now implement what best practices are. Um, looking forward to, to bringing in um, uh, Sevi Padilla and um, some others to help us look at that. Um, I was going to mention, and I'll just mention it now as opposed to in my superintendent remarks, um, we had a really great meeting on uh, Monday? Was it yesterday? Monday. Yeah, yeah yesterday um, we had uh, Mary Ga Chief Mary Gavin was here with her team um, talking about, uh, this, and it was our leadership team, our central office leadership team, and about six school officers, or six officers were here with Ms. Gavin, um, talking about school safety and security and some, th some measures that we can continue to look at to determine what are the best hardening practices but also um, talking about what are best practices in active shooter um, situations and the like. And so uh, Tom Palera, who is the crisis management um, specialist here in the city, made a presentation around some new practices that are probably more aligned to what um, would be appropriate in an emergency situation. So we were actually thinking about having him come in and brief the board as well as part of that series. Um, so, so it's a long way of saying we've got some information coming, but we've also taken appropriate steps to uh, resolve some of the immediate issues, particularly at the high school, around um, some doors and um, some cameras. And so you may recall that there were some doors that everybody knew. If you pulled on them hard enough, they would open. Um, I'm happy to report you can't do that anymore. Um, it cost us about $30,000 to fix the doors that needed to be fixed, um, but we were able to um, take care of those, and we also installed a new camera on the back side of the school for entrance purposes, um, and we continue to um, look at our safety practices there. Any other potential agenda items? If not, I will to the superintendent's report. So I, so again, I just mentioned the cult meeting with uh, Mary Gavin. One other follow-up to that is um, we also are looking at our, uh, as part of our practice crisis communication, um, and John Brett is sort of taking the lead on that for us. Um, and he has a task force meeting that's coming up on Thursday to, to think about how do we communicate effectively during a crisis and also how do we effectively allow students to communicate if they see <coughs> something, how do they say something. And so we're looking at a variety of different apps that may be able to be used. We're looking at um, some other technological solutions that potentially could be anonymous, like a tip line, those kinds of things as well. Um, so we, we are sort of hitting it from multiple aspects um, as we continue to go forward. The um, state of Virginia reported today that preliminary math uh, numbers are uh, and reading numbers are on the rise across the state of Virginia. In fact, um, the NAEP results came out, um, which is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and um, Virginia exceeds um, all other states in reading and mathematics, uh, or all other NAEP participants, I should say, uh, in reading and mathematics. And uh, I'm very anxious based on the incredible work that our schools have been doing this year to really provide timely tailored intervention by name and by need for the students that are in most, uh, most trouble academically. Uh, and the fact that they've figured out how to get in with kids and how to create those intervention practices uh, and processes uh, to see how our performance is this year in some of those gap groups that we see. Um, that have been struggling. Um, I am uh, very happy to report uh, another John Brett uh, issue here tonight. Um, we are streaming live across the, the intraweb, <laughs> um, the internet tonight, um, and this is the first time that the streaming has actually gone off without a hitch. Um, so thank you, John, and thank you to our great technician back here for getting us going. Uh, and uh, so now anyone can watch from home if they wish. Um, but we'd prefer to have we'd prefer to have you here, of course. Uh, 
there's context to everything, right? So it's important to be able to see the facial expressions and, and hear how people speak. Um, and then I just want to um, just give a shout out to the remarkable support of our community. We've had a number of big events lately um, where our community has been involved. Um, the 10th grade uh, middle years exhibition program, we had over a dozen judges come and help judge our, our uh, MYP projects. If you had a chance to see them, um, in the gyms at George Mason. They were absolutely incredible. Uh, there were kids, I think I told the story to a couple of people, you know, they had this challenge or an idea or something that they wanted to kind of go off on. And uh, we had one student who's a musician, and she said, I learned how to play the, the French horn. And uh, I was talking to her, and I said, well, that's an interesting project. Uh, you know, I was thinking to myself, that's not all that challenging, right? I mean, they start in elementary school learning how to play the French horn, you know, you get a few notes. and. Anyway, she, and then she said and went on to say, I, I already play the trumpet, which sort of made it feel like even less challenging to me. And I thought this is an, and then and I said, what is the substantive difference between a French horn and a trumpet? Does anybody know? Play the French horn with your left hand. <laughs> so just the fact that she switched hands and, and sort of took on this challenge and it was different notation and um, the like was really incredible. So there were, there were that, all the way to these incredible science experiments that kids were engaged in to projects on uh, some other things. So anyway, it was a great MYP exhibition. Our fifth grade PYP exhibitions uh, where student groups uh, are having opportunities to interact with other people um, to include diplomats. Uh, one of our students um, at Thomas Jefferson is doing a project on climate change and had a chance to speak to the person who negotiated the Paris Climate Accords. Um, and so I think that that's pretty amazing. Um, and, and I actually was interviewed by a couple of students um, about, <coughs> about school safety and security. And so that was a lot of fun too. And some of you may have uh, been interviewed as well. But we have uh, lots of people that are going into the schools. Um, and that's been exciting. Um, and then the Henderson Career Fair, uh, which is uh, this Friday. And we'll have ho close to 100 presenters there talking about um, a multiple different careers to all of our kids. And that's very exciting. So all of that to say, you know, when we think about our community and what we bring to bear as a resource, um, the adults in this community are absolutely incredible. And the way that our principals and our teachers leverage that uh, opportunity with our parents is amazing. So I uh, just wanted to say thanks to also our community for reaching out and supporting our schools that way as well. So. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, anyone have any questions for the superintendent? If not, we will move on to board and student liaison comments. And I'll <coughs> start with Mr. Anderson this time. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually don't have any comments to make at this point. OK. Move on down. Um, yes, I could. Last night I attended the Education Foundation Board of Directors meeting, and um, they have a lot of great planning going on with regard to, I guess, short-term goals, long-term goals, small goals, big goals, um, but they're putting a lot more into it, and I think as the foundation continues to grow, um, that it will just continue to support our schools more and provide a lot more exciting things. So I know that Dr. Noonan's been talking to Debbie Hiscott a lot about some interesting ideas. And the board was really receptive and excited about that. Um, and then, of course, they have the big gala coming up. So yeah. everybody get their tickets and go to the gala. Okay. Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, daycare advisory board was going to meet yesterday. They had some scheduling issues. They were going to meet tonight, and they couldn't get a quorum. So that, that will be deferred until next month. Uh, I went last month to the March for Our Lives, and, and I commend Dr. Noonan. I think the the mental health issues associated with gun violence are, are real and, and pervasive for all students. And there was one student with a target on her back saying, am I next? And I think that was sort of emblematic of the kind of anxiety that, that is a, a byproduct of this problem. So I'm glad that we're moving forward on that. And that's, that's all I have. Ms. Layton? Um, the Special <coughs> Education Committee met last night. Um, we met at Jesse Thackeray, and so we got to hear about a lot of the work they're doing at Thackeray. Um, and just exciting to hear really uh, kind of how unique that program is and how it's really a model to a lot of the state, the way we have such an integrated program. So it was great. 
Ms. Gill? Uh, I was at the Chamber of Commerce meeting this morning. They're doing a shop local campaign to start in November. So uh, try to involve the schools in that as well. Mary Beth was there. Um, and then uh, speaking about anxiety, you may have noticed in the morning announcements there's now a, um, like a tip or information from Health and Wellness. Um, the committee decided to take that on, and Bridget Craft and some of the other counselors are working to put that together, um, really giving information to parents about anxiety, noticing signs in your children, how to help them deal with anxiety, and how to how to not cause more anxiety for your kids. Um, so trying to integrate some of the themes that Justin brought up to I, I do not have a go back real quick. I'm sorry. And I mentioned this last night at... Um, the foundation meeting and I thought I'd bring it up to the full board and to the community to kind of hear something that we're sort of trying to work the details out on right now but I think could be really powerful for the community. Um, throughout the course of this year one of the things that I've heard from the LEAP committee um, is that there is a need for a family resource center um, here in the city of Falls Church and I have not ever worked in a system that didn't have a family resource center and, and I don't happen to disagree with that notion of needing one. So I, um, I, I was at home talking to um, Dr. Bethany Latique, who is a <laughs> professor at George Mason University, sort of expressing this uh, need and she said, well, why don't you um, consider coming to talk to one of my classes about it? And she works in the human development and family science um, area um, and works with students that are looking to try to get into public education or to some sort of community service um, organization and so anyway long story short is I went uh, and I guest lectured at George Mason about two weeks ago and as part of that I was talking with the students about this idea of a, of a family resource center um, not knowing necessarily what it would look like or where it would be put or any of the details um, but the idea of having a place where parents could come in the community, whether you were an English language learner or a parent of a special needs student or whatever the case may be, to talk and to get some print resources and to get some support and the like. Um, and the students um, were really into it and asked a lot of questions. And it was a class of about 25 or so. And so I went home, I came back to work, and then I went home that night. And Dr. Latique said, you're not going <coughs> to believe what happened. And I said, what's that? And she said, when you left, the students asked if um, we could scrap the rest of the class and all of the coursework that's associated with it and focus on developing a family resource center in the city of Falls Church. And so they have, in their class, created now um, a, a, an assignment, if you will, where there, there are four teams in the class that are all doing research and development of what a good family resource center could look like in the city of Falls Church. And Debbie Hiscott and um, Jeannie Seabridge and myself, not this coming Tuesday, but the following Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 10, are, uh, 9 to 10 are going to go and listen to the pitches of these different teams around what a good family resource center could look like here in the city of Falls Church. And then we will adopt one or modifications of all of them um, as sort of the idea of how we're going to develop this family resource center. And if that weren't enough, <laughs> um, what else has sort of happened now is the students have said to, to Bethany, we don't want it just to end there. We would like to come in as interns in the city of Falls Church and help stand up this family resource center over the summer. Is there a way that we could do that? So George Mason uh, has sent us their intern agreement. We're going to work through the logistics of it, um, identify a preceptor who will be the intern coordinator here um, to bring in eight uh, interns that would then do a couple of things. They would, they're going to use the adapt it model, it's called. So they're going to take the model that has been adopted by, the, by us and by the class as those best practices that are associated with a family resource center and then they're going to go to the LEAP committee and they're going to go out into the community and talk with people and go to the read and roll and the nights where there are things and meet with the families to say, how does this feel? Does this look like it's the right model or not? And then make appropriate modifications to what that could look like based on the feedback that they're getting from the people that they're talking to. So it's sort of a community-based participatory research project that these students are going to do. Um, and then the Ed Foundation has not 
directly committed but has said that they would like to support the, the re some of the resource necessary to bring this resource center up to um, par. So between the eight interns out talking with people, identifying what the best practices are, and then some resource behind it from the Ed Foundation, I think that in the fall we'll be able to open a resource center. Again, I don't know where it's going to be, but I'm really excited about this project and I thought I'd share it with you and um, uh, just so you could get excited with me. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. Wow. Things that happen so, just dropping by from George Mason in the class one day. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Next, you'll have to guest lecture at a school of architecture, and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Castillo, I don't even need to do that, and here's why. At at George Mason High School and at Mary Ellen Henderson, already I've gotten about 15 emails from students talking about what good runoff should look like and what the architecture <laughs> should look like and what good downstream stormwater management looks like. So I think, you know, we're going to take those and pass those on to, the, the, to those developers. But we've got those resources right in-house. <laughs> I remember when we uh, visited uh, MEH, there were students working on that type of project about run, stormwater runoff and how to do that. So I was, and they all had great ideas. I was like, wow, we have, do have a bunch of budding folks getting into um, environmental um, sustainability issues there. So it's, we, we, got, we got a whole bunch of in-house in folks kind of giving us some great ideas there. So We got six projects from students and uh, from one teacher, and, and I think, Ms. High, you saw those as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, send, we'll send them to the board <coughs> so that you can see them. And picking up on the theme of the MYP projects, at one, of, one of the projects at the MYP showcase was uh, high, one of the high school students talking about polling that he had done among other students about features they either liked or didn't like about current school and what should be in the new one too. Oh. So it was an interesting one to see it, the decision processes that he went through and figuring out which questions to ask and then how to digest the data. It was, it was pretty good. That's great. Any other comments? All right. Um, briefly on my end, um, just as the, the budget process continues to move forward and working with the general government, I just want to just reiterate the, what I feel of the hard work of the board in front of and behind the scenes, working with uh, community members, working with um, general government members of the city council, also, our staff for the hard work that they've put into this particular process. Uh, I think this year's budget process has been one of the, I feel, most transparent that we've done in my five years on the board, uh, where with some prodding from us, but doing a lot of it on their own by having a new superintendent and having a new CFO in place going about building a budget very differently than we have in a number of years, um, building a, 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 what I think, a very needs-oriented budget, working around our triennial plan, um, thinking about what we need, and the long list that we've seen and folks can see as well of needs that our, our five schools presented, definitely our needs, but were not necessarily immediate in the triennial plan that we ultimately will work towards funding those in, in, ne in prior year, next year budgets, but, um, but what we funded this year, and quite frankly, I have not seen before in my time of living in Falls Church of the school board actually doing a deep dive scrubbing numbers and coming up with half a million dollars to help fund a lot of the, the projects that we we're just talk, some that we were talking about this evening um, to make sure that because of a big capital project that we passed this past um, November, making sure that we, we finally get our new high school, but also recognizing that we have fiscal constraints on all time and we want to do our part to do that and coming up with a budget request that has been the lowest in a number of years of 2.8%. I think we've done a a very strong, good job of work as a board, as a staff here at Central Office and staff within our schools to make sure that we do our part. Our teachers, as some have made comments the other evening about um, the 3% budgeting um, um, COLA increase for them, 
um, they many are are recognizing saying that they are because of last year we just did I believe just a cost of living last year if I'm not mis if I'm correct that you know they saw because of other outlying things that went up of medical on uh, things like that some of them took home less money overall and I think for us as a community we need to make sure that as we talk about diverse community, affordable community for all folks to have an opportunity to live here in our community, I think we have to look at that as well for our teaching staff to be able to to have an affordable wage and being able to potentially live in the city of Falls Church. Many of our teachers, I think 25% of our teachers live, live here in the community where everyone else lives and commutes, commutes into Falls Church. And ultimately, I would I would dare say some of those folks, when they start looking at the the bottom line of making that commute, gas costs, cost of of housing and those type of things, and and our teaching staff, as one pointed out to me, is starting to shift to be a little younger and starting to think about families, starting to think about buying homes, that they may live in Loudoun County and. If we don't continue to make our salaries part of, as well as other, you know, benefits of being a teacher of uh, professional development and those things, an important piece of what we do here, that drive that they make of an hour or more in the mornings may not be as attractive to come to Falls Church that they may look at that quality of life of staying out in Loudoun County or in Fairfax County versus coming to Falls Church. Um, and that will become more of a challenge for us to recruit and retain some of the great teachers that we do. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that um, as we continue to work as closely as we can with the general government, with our community, that just we recognize that it's a, a shared, we all have the same shared goal of making Falls Church a livable, affordable community. And I think we are doing our part, and but I definitely I think our schools are an important part of that puzzle and working towards making sure that we get on the, the request that we put in, which I think is a modest one um, for the funding that we, we went in-house looking for to fund a lot of our potential projects. I think we've done a great job this year. Um, and. I hope in the future that we continue to, in this summer, have a true conversation about the uh, revenue sharing. Um, because ultimately, until we have that conversation and everyone comes to the table recognizing that they're going to give up a little something in that conversation, um, we will continue to have these back and forth conversations about values in the city and no one wants to have those conversations of the us against them because we are one city. We're a fairly small city that, that values those things, but we need to make sure that do everything we can to make sure that we have as civil of, of those conversations as possible. And I do think if we all go to the table, potentially this summer, talking about revenue sharing and recognize everyone comes with an open mind that we all aren't going to get what we exactly want, but it's something that we all can live with. I think we'll be in a much better place, hopefully, this time next year and not having the back and forth that we seem to be having currently. So um, with that, we'll move on to approval of minutes. Thank you, Ms. Goodell, for, for getting those all worked out and together. Um, so I will ask unanimous consent for approval of the minutes of March 13th, 2018, March 19th, 2018, and March 20th, 2018. Uh, without objection. <coughs> I'll yeah, abstain oh. from uh, March 13th. If it was. Okay. I abstain from the 20th. With those two abstentions, without objection, so ordered. And we have a couple items for for reading, uh, enrollment numbers, uh, budget status report, and then we also have potential additional budget questions that may have come in. And I don't know if you want to. I, I talk would love a little bit to just say a minute. 
Um, the monthly enrollment reports are posted just the same as the prior months. Um, when we look at the budget report, this is following up on our last discussion at a work session um, where we presented a quarterly report. This is the first of the monthly reports. We really want to work to continuously improve this, so I really appreciate all of the feedback that I've received from you to date, and we're really open to getting additional feedback. So when you look at this report, I just wanted to point out on the first page, you'll see off to the right there's a box that says projected year-end activity. That's something that was discussed at the last meeting, presenting where we project to be at the end of the year based on these high-level revenue and expenditure categories. Um, and we're still working through all of those projections. Um, Michelle Kopic has been working really hard on budget and school finance. Um, so in the future, we'll fill those in, but I wanted the board to be able to see what that format would look like. Um, so just know when you look at that first page um, that those are not yet done, but that's our goal is then we would be reporting to you not only where are we at for this month in the fiscal year, but where do we think we're going to be at the end. Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to point out as part of this um, continuous improvement, when you look at page two, we've included comparison data with prior years. So one of the things we showed before is where were we at in terms of our expenditures as of a specific fiscal month. Um, when you look at that, it's kind of hard to know how that, you know, is it good, is it bad, are we ahead, are we behind? Um, so this chart at the top shows the numbers in a tabular form, looking at how does month nine, which is the end of March, compare to March in the prior two fiscal years. So we included that data in a tabular form as well as a graphic, right? And then we just included some notes for the board in terms of when you look at expenditures, those trends across the three years. Um, are very similar, but when you look at revenue, based on the timing of when revenue is received and posted, you know, our revenue variances really appear um, quite dramatic, um, but in large part that's impacted by timing. So our goal really is, as we work through these reports, to continue to present to the board data in better and more useful formats each month, and then we really want to look at our processing too to see if we can get improvements in terms of um, consistency and timing and other things to make this data much more meaningful over time. Um, so just I really appreciate all the feedback I've got. Um, please continue to give us feedback as we work through this. And um, we really hope that this can be an ongoing great process and dialogue, um, not only as we finish this fiscal year, but as we start to work through the next. It would be a great tool for the community to, to look at as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any final questions or anything for, for the good of the order? I, I would just say, I, I don't know how much time went into this, but I think we should be mindful that it does take work. And without context and explanation, how do we extract signal from the noise here of a monthly snapshot? And, and I think we should revisit the frequency to make sure that we're getting benefit from this. And, and truly, we appreciate that comment. We also have really been thinking about what tools can we use in terms of having you know, kind of data that's more readily available that doesn't require any human intervention, right? To that note, we've been looking at a tool from a company called open.gov, and um, we're also waiting to see the upgrade to our current financial system, Munis, which is a Taylor product. Um, they too have information. So we really do want to be mindful of the frequency, the usefulness of the data, and then what other opportunities do we have in terms of giving better data, um, and, and data that provides a much better picture. So thank you for those comments. Any other comments? And just for those of us who were at the city council meeting last night, we were out <laughs> two hours about ahead. two hours ahead of uh, <laughs> our colleagues on the, <laughs> on the general government side. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michelle, for your incredible work. Yay, Michelle Kopic. <laughs>